colleagues and friends, I'd like to start by saying what a joy it is to welcome Metropolitan Callistos back to CUA. He has been here a number of times before. And many congratulations, Eminence, on being the recipient of our Quaston Medal. I first came to know Metropolitan Callistos about 20 years ago when I was doing my doctoral research in Oxford. He very kindly supervised me for a term when my own director was away. The English system being rather different from our system here, there was no coursework component for the doctorate, but I nevertheless eagerly attended a number of Metropolitan Callistos's lectures, not only for the great wisdom that he imparted, but also for the sheer pleasure of the experience. I regard it as an honor and a blessing to be working once again with Metropolitan Callistos now in the context of the dialogue which we hope and pray may help to restore full communion between Catholics and Orthodox. I'd like to begin our reflections on this afternoon's theme by recalling something that is said to have happened one day in the late 1940s. The great philosopher Wittgenstein went over from Cambridge to Oxford to visit two distinguished colleagues, Elizabeth Anscombe and FLA Hart. At the end of the day, they were all together on the station platform in Oxford, deep in conversation. So deep in conversation were they that they didn't see the train pull in and only realized it was there as it began to move off. This being a time when you could still do such things, Professor Anscombe ran down the platform, managed to open a door, and jumped on. Professor Hart, likewise, ran along the platform, opened a door, and climbed aboard. Professor Wittgenstein ran along the platform, but didn't manage to get the train. He stood exhausted at the end of the platform, looking forlornly at the disappearing train. Someone came up and said, don't worry, there's another train in half an hour. But you don't understand, he said. They were supposed to be seeing me off. <laughs> The moral of the story, it would seem, is always remember what it is you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> when Pope Benedict XVI went to Istanbul in November 2006, he and ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew said in their joint declaration that the mission, go make disciples of all nations, was today more timely and necessary than ever even in traditionally Christian countries. Our traditions, they said, represent for us a patrimony which must be continually shared, proposed, and interpreted anew. This is why we must strengthen our cooperation and our common witness before the world. What the church is supposed to be doing is proclaiming the gospel of reconciliation to the world, proclaiming Christ, who left his followers the gift of peace, a peace the world cannot give, as he himself said. The world craves peace. How urgent it is for Christians to recognize their calling to bear witness to the peace that only the Lord himself can give. On the first, or one of the first, of the overseas trips that Pope John Paul II made back in 1979 was to Istanbul, Constantinople, for the patronal feast of St. Andrew, and he said some memorable and urgent words there. I quote, This visit to the first see of the Orthodox Church shows clearly the will of the whole Catholic Church to go forward in the march towards the full unity of all. And he added that the re-establishment of full communion between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church was vital for progress of the whole ecumenical movement. 
The division between us, he said, has not been without influence on the other divisions that followed. That's why Catholic Orthodox dialogue is so important. Our division set a terrible example to other Christians centuries later at the time of the Reformation that it's okay to live separate lives as Christians when it isn't. We must repent now and set a far better example of reconciliation. For nearly a whole millennium, Pope John Paul continued, the two sister churches grew side by side as two great, vital and complementary traditions of the same Church of Christ, maintaining communion in faith, prayer and charity, despite their different sensibilities. The second millennium, on the contrary, he said, was darkened by the sense of estrangement which the two churches felt towards each other, with all the fatal consequences of this, and the wound is not yet healed. Nevertheless, he said, the Lord can cure it, and he bids us do our best to help the process. Surely, the Pope added, it is time to quicken our pace towards perfect brotherly reconciliation so that the dawn of the third millennium may find us standing side by side in full communion, witnessing again to salvation before the world, which needs this sign of unity if it is to be evangelized. Again, that's what we're supposed to be doing, witnessing together to salvation before the world. Father, may they all be one, so that the world may believe. At that meeting, the Pope and the Ecumenical Patriarch announced the establishment of a formal theological dialogue between the two churches. And the dialogue subsequently made strong progress through the 1980s. As you just heard, Pope John Paul set a target of the start of the new millennium for the re-establishment of full communion. In 1993, I edited a volume containing the agreed statement so far achieved and including some extra papers, including one by Metropolitan Callistos. And with Pope John Paul's words in my mind, I called it one in 2000, question mark. As I've mentioned to some of you before, a certain English bishop, when he saw the title of the book, One in 2000, and heard that it was about Catholic Orthodox unity, asked whether the title indicated a target date or the betting odds. <laughs> As we all know, this relationship is not an easy one. But it has never been easy. And yet for the first thousand years of Christianity, East and West were able to live more or less in full communion. It's imperative that we find the way once again to do so. Catholic Orthodox dialogue hit severe difficulties around 1990 with the fall of communism. A new freedom of religion allowed many members of Eastern Catholic churches, some of which had been brutally repressed under the Soviet Empire, to reassert their Catholic identity, thus raising again the thorny issue of unitism. Other topics were currently being treated in the, in the dialogue, but Orthodox delegates insisted that this topic be moved to the very top of the agenda a statement on unitism, firmly calling it the method of union of the past and contrasting it with the present search for full communion was agreed at Balamand in Lebanon in 1993. But even that, sadly, did not clear the air. A rather acrimonious meeting here in Baltimore followed in the year 2000. And then many thought that the dialogue had just run into the sand. The good news that Metropolitan Callistos and I can bear witness to today is that the dialogue is now once again underway and is making progress. A newly constituted international commission met in Belgrade in September 2006 
And we made such good progress that instead of waiting the customary two years between plenary meetings, we decided to meet again in 2007 in Ravenna. And there we finalized another agreed statement. The first one at the international level between Catholics and Orthodox for 14 years. It's worth noting that we were welcomed to Serbia not only by Patriarch Pavle and the Serbian Orthodox Church, but also by the civil authorities. Both the Prime Minister and the President of Serbia hosted dinners for us. Why? Well, here's what Mr. Kostunica, the Prime Minister, said. The churches of East and West are setting an extraordinary example by means of their dialogue. The greatest gift to contemporary humanity would be to convince people, perhaps first and foremost the political elites, that there is no alternative to dialogue and that every form of application of force dictate or imposition of one's own models and solutions in service of primarily personal interests destroys the last remaining bridges between confronted peoples and communities instead of building peace, confidence, solidarity and cooperation. We heard those appreciative words after driving to the Prime Minister's residence through streets still containing the wrecked remains of buildings from the NATO bombing of 1999 in the conflict over Kosovo, a place dramatically in the news once again this week. The Prime Minister's words were heartfelt. In the modern world, there is no alternative to dialogue to resolve problems. And he saw the dialogue now taking place after centuries of division between our churches as setting an extraordinary example of that fact to the world. In 2007, the civil authorities in Ravenna received us equally warmly and gave the same reason for wanting to associate themselves publicly with what we were doing. The world warms to the witness of dialogue. Even before the full communion we hope for, our very dialogue is itself a work of God's grace, a sign of peace that already exerts its attraction on the suffering and anxious people of today. The world has indeed been waiting for this witness and it is incumbent upon us to give it and to press on to the witness of full communion. Cardinal Caspar recently said, that in the 20th century, horribly marked by war and innocent suffering, ecumenism was a light shining in the darkness and a powerful peace movement. Snappy titles have never been a forte of Catholic Orthodox documents. <laughs> and last October's Ravenna text is no exception. It bears the title, Ecclesiological and Canonical Consequences of the Sacramental Nature of the Church. Subtitle, Ecclesial Communion, Conciliarity and Authority. Don't be deterred. It's actually a very readable text which gives an account of the communion life of the church in which all of the baptized participate. By virtue of baptism and confirmation or chrismation, it says, each member of the church exercises a form of authority in the body of Christ. In this sense, all the faithful, and not just the bishops, are responsible for the faith professed at their baptism. Each one is called, according to the gifts of the one Holy Spirit, to serve within the community. The bishops, of course, have a particular calling to serve. As successors of the apostles, it says, the bishops are responsible for communion in the apostolic faith and for fidelity to the demands of a life in keeping with the gospel. 
councils, it says, are the principal way in which communion among bishops is exercised, and conciliarity, the gathering of bishops in council to confer and act together, has been a hallmark of church life from the beginning. Nevertheless, the co-responsibility that implies among the bishops is already a feature of the life of all the baptized. So the text builds up from the communion life of the baptized, fundamentally sustained by the Eucharist, to conciliarity proper among the bishops. Ever since this dialogue began, it has been concerned to clarify what the life of communion, or koinonia, that comes to the church from God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit should look like. The very first agreed statement of 1982 said this, the church finds its model, its origin, and its purpose in the mystery of God, one in three persons. The institutional elements of the church should be nothing but a visible reflection of the reality of the mystery. What exactly does this mean? That Munich text of 1982 sketched an initial answer. It said this, The one and only church is a communion of many communities, local churches. And the local church is itself a communion of persons. Our Ravenna text takes up the same question, and it asks, how do institutional elements of the church visibly express and serve the mystery of koinonia? To answer, it distinguishes three levels in the life of the church. The local level, the regional level, and the universal level. The history and the tradition of the church show that at each level, communion or conciliarity has had a focal point in the one who is first, protos, or head, kephale. The bishop is the first, or head, among his people in the local church. The metropolitan, or patriarch, is the first, or head, among the neighboring bishops at the regional level of church life. And there has also been, and ought to be, a first or head at the universal level among the metropolitans and patriarchs. Primacy at all levels, says the text, is a practice firmly grounded in the canonical tradition of the church. But of course, it must never be forgotten that primacy and conciliarity are mutually interdependent. Perhaps you felt a little tingle or frisson as I heard, as I mentioned those words. I certainly did myself as we discussed them and agreed them in the context of our meeting. We're facing the most controversial issue of all between Catholics and Orthodox, namely universal primacy, the papacy, and we're preparing to tackle it. The Ravenna Statement might be regarded as base camp for an attempt on Mount Everest. <laughs> what was agreed at Ravenna was only a first stage, yes, but a vital first stage nonetheless. We agreed that you can talk about the life of the church as having a universal level, and that the communion life of the church requires there to be a primate at that level as at the other two levels. There's the achievement of base camp. The glance up the mountain from base camp comes in the sentence which immediately follows, and I quote, while the fact of primacy at the universal level is accepted by both West and East, there are differences of understanding with regard to the manner in which it is to be exercised, and also with regard to its scriptural and theological foundations. There is, of course, no doubt that there is only one candidate for the office of universal primate, namely the Bishop of Rome. The text acknowledges that Rome has always been first in the listing or taxis of major sees from ancient times. The Roman Church presides in love 
as Saint Ignatius of Antioch said long ago. It remains, says the document in conclusion, for the role of the Bishop of Rome in the communion of all the churches to be studied in greater depth. What is the specific function of the Bishop of the First See in an ecclesiology of koinonia? How should the teaching of the First and Second Vatican Councils on the universal primacy be understood and lived in the light of the ecclesial practice of the first millennium? These, says the Ravenna text, are crucial questions for our dialogue and for our hopes of restoring full communion between us. Nevertheless, the text affirms the members of the Commission are convinced that this statement represents positive and significant progress in our dialogue and that it provides a firm basis for future discussion of the primacy at the universal level in the Church. A long road lies ahead and its stages are already apparent from the words just quoted. The first task already agreed as our next topic is to examine the role of the Bishop of Rome in the communion of the church in the first millennium. Metropolitan Callistos and I were in Rome just last week for the first meeting of a subcommission dealing with that very theme. There are actually two subcommissions currently now uh, currently at work on the topic. And these deliberations will feed into the next meeting of the Joint Coordinating Committee of the Dialogue in the fall of this year, and ultimately into the next plenary meeting in 2009. Study of the second millennium must, of course, follow that. And the aim is finally to determine what role the Bishop of Rome can and should play in the communion of the Church as a whole, West and East, today. In the limited time available this afternoon, I would now like simply to highlight a few significant features and aspects of this very particular ecclesial relationship. The importance of the first millennium has already been mentioned. This period, prior to the tragic events of 1054, offers essential guidance for our future communion. It's referred to as the era of the undivided church. But we should note that there were in fact many breaches of communion between Rome and Constantinople during that time. Yves Congar calculates that between 323 and 787 there were five such breaks of communion, totaling 203 years. These were all eventually healed and communion was restored. Thus, we look back and with the benefit of hindsight call it the undivided church. We recognize that there was still one church, albeit in a state of extreme internal tension at those times. When, please God, we attain full communion once again, will it not be right to look back and make the same fundamental judgment about the second millennium? And since an essential hallmark of Christian existence, animated and sustained by the Eucharist, is to live already in the hope of future grace, ought we not to behave and act as one church as far as possible already today? In that light, the agreed statements so far reached by Catholics and Orthodox are precious occasions when we have practiced speaking together as one again after so many years apart. How profoundly right was the decision made in 1980, and I quote, that the dialogue should begin with the elements which unite Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches. This in no way means that it is desirable or even possible to avoid the problems which still divide the two churches. It only means that the dialogue should begin in a positive spirit and that this spirit should prevail when treating the problems which have accumulated during a separation lasting many centuries.
end of quote, from the plan that was officially launched in 1980 for this dialogue. Statements on Eucharist, Church and Trinity, faith, sacraments and ecclesial unity, ordination, apostolic succession and sanctification all followed swiftly as a blessed reminder of how much we share. Many of us would hold, said Yves Congar, that on the level of the ancient conception of the church as a unity of faith, a sacramental reality and a spiritual organism, it is the same church. Between East and West, everything is similar, and yet, all is different. Even what is essentially the same thing, he said. That's the paradox. As Vatican II said, the heritage handed down by the Apostles was received differently and in different forms, so that from the very beginnings of the Church, its development varied from region to region, and also because of differing mentalities and ways of life. After recognizing that primordial complementarity between West and East, the Council urged all who would work for full communion to give proper attention to the origin and growth of the churches of the East and to the character of the relations which obtained between them and the Roman See before the separation and to form for themselves a correct evaluation of these facts. That's exactly what we're trying to do now in the dialogue, to form a correct evaluation of the place of the Bishop of Rome in the complex communion life of the undivided church of the first millennium. It must honestly be said that Catholics have had a tendency to oversimplify the story. In 1894, Pope Leo XIII issued an encyclical letter, Praeclara Gratulationis, on the reunion of Christendom. His passion for reunion, especially between the Eastern churches and the Catholic Church, was palpable. But we might perhaps raise an eyebrow at his reading of history. The main issue between us, he rightly said, is the primacy of the Roman Pontiff. Now before 1054, he said, the East, like the West, agreed without hesitation in its obedience to the Pontiff of Rome, as the legitimate successor of Peter and therefore the Vicar of Christ. Moreover, in the two reunion councils held after the separation, Metropolitan Callistos is shaking his head already, <laughs> The Second Council of Lyon and the Council of Florence, Latins and Greeks, said Pope Leo, easily agreed and all unanimously proclaimed as dogma the supreme power of the Roman pontiffs. <laughs> In an encyclical letter of 1895, the Patriarch of Constantinople said that he hesitated to respond directly to the papal encyclical because, and I quote, it is unprofitable to speak to the ears of those who do not hear. <laughs> We're now trying very hard to work on the history together and to hear what each other is saying. So the first millennium is more complex than might at first appear. But so also is the schism of 1054. What actually happened is that the papal legate, Cardinal Humbert, and his companions laid a bull of excommunication on the altar of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople against Patriarch Michael Cerularius and some fellow bishops. Since the West had introduced the filioque into the creed, Humbert's allegation that, among other things, the East had removed the filioque <laughs> I might raise another eyebrow. Eight days later, Cerularius responded by excommunicating the legates. Both acts were personal. They weren't directed against the respective churches, and the Pope who had sent Humbert had died in the meantime. So Humbert really shouldn't have acted at all. <laughs> <laughs> 
In itself, this was certainly no more serious than the previous breaks of communion subsequently repaired. The catastrophe is that this break simply wasn't repaired. By the grace of God, 900 years later, in 1965, two extraordinary church leaders, Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athenagoras, finally lifted the excommunications and a new chapter of history was opened. But by then, a lot of damage had been done. The sack of Constantinople by the Crusaders in 1204 and the installation of a Latin patriarch there were particularly ruinous for relations. In 2004, I was invited to have a discussion on the morning of Easter Sunday on BBC Radio with an Orthodox priest in the UK. And I said, as we were setting this up, to the producer of the program, presumably we're having this dialogue on Easter Sunday because Catholics and Orthodox are actually celebrating Easter on the same day this year. Oh no, she said, it's because it's the 800th anniversary of the sack of Constantinople. <laughs> That was a good start. <laughs> I'm happy to report that the dialogue on Easter Sunday went very nicely. <laughs> Henry Chadwick says, if we think how on earth we should try and evaluate this very complex and curious rupture, churches are out of communion with one another if they come to feel and think that they are. The events of 1054 he says, were more symptomatic of a state of mind than a primary cause. Humbert's basic conviction, says Chadwick, was that obedience to papal authority was the key to unlock all disputed matters. Needless to say, that was not the primary conviction in the East. So the big issue in the background was, and still is, that of Roman primacy. Yves Congar says, the sin of schism is already committed in the heart when we behave as though we were not an integral part of the whole with others, not members one of another in one body, as St. Paul taught the Romans. Earlier, with reference to all Christian divisions, not just this one, Yves Congar said, we have got into the way of living without each other and in opposition to each other as parallel lines of Christianity which never meet. In other words, we have ceased caring about each other and wanting to be one. And that is primarily a sin against charity. Bearing in mind Congar's warning, about parallel lines that never meet, we might well ponder the following words, which begin to see the chance of convergence. They were written in 1926. Catholics and Orthodox are not enemies, but brothers. We share the same faith, we participate in the same sacraments, and especially in the same Eucharist. We are divided only by some misunderstandings about the constitution of the Church of Jesus Christ. The persons who were the cause of those misunderstandings have been dead for centuries. Let us abandon the old disputes. And each in his own area, let us work to better our brothers by giving them good example. Later on, although we have travelled along different paths, we shall find each other again in union among the churches, which together will form the one true church of our Lord Jesus Christ. The author of those beautiful words in 1926 was the new apostolic visitor in Sofia, Bulgaria, Archbishop Angelo Roncalli, who became Pope John the Twenty Third in 1958, and promptly called the Second Vatican Council. As Pope, 
he invited the whole church to learn and practice what he himself had learnt and practiced in Bulgaria, namely the primacy of charity in ecumenical relations. Particularly when it comes to relations between Catholics and Orthodox, we can never be reminded enough of the primacy of charity. The Russian Orthodox theologian Nicholas Afanasyev, who was an observer at the final session of Vatican II, reflected deeply on this very theme. I quote, When love has once again become the foundation of life in all the churches, then dogmatic di divergences that seem insurmountable will be removed in the light of this love. Christian people have placed knowledge above love because they have forgotten that our knowledge is imperfect and our prophesying is imperfect, as Paul tells the Corinthians. When love is raised higher than knowledge, said Afanasyev, then knowledge itself will be perfected. As I suppose everybody knows by now, there were tensions at Ravenna, not between Catholics and Orthodox, but on the Orthodox side, between Moscow and Constantinople, because of the presence at the plenary meeting of delegates from the Church of Estonia that Constantinople recognizes, but Moscow does not. As a result, the Moscow delegation withdrew from the meeting. These tensions have unfortunately persisted. In his message to Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew for the patronal feast of St. Andrew on the 30th of November last year, Pope Benedict recalled the difficulties experienced at Ravenna and said, I pray earnestly that these may soon be clarified and resolved so that there may be full participation again in the next plenary session. It seems to me that this situation only serves to highlight the urgency of the very topic we are currently discussing. We're endeavoring to re-establish the original ordering or taxis of the churches, part of the purpose of which was to indicate a mechanism for the resolution of disputes. One of the most frequent services that Rome, the first protos or primus in the taxis, offered in the communion of the church in the first millennium was that of being a, a final court of appeal. As Vatican II said, for many centuries the churches of the East and of the West went their own ways, though a brotherly communion of faith and sacramental life bound them together. If disagreements in faith and discipline arose among them, the Roman See acted by common consent as moderator. Perhaps that conciliar text was in Cardinal Caspar's mind when he said that the present dispute is an inter-orthodox question in which Catholics cannot interfere, but that nevertheless, if Constantinople and Moscow wish, we could seek to facilitate a solution, he said. In his writings on primacy, Metropolitan John Zizulus of Pergamon, the Orthodox co-chairman of the International Dialogue, as Cardinal Caspar is the Catholic co-chairman, maintains that after the schism, Constantinople, previously number two in the taxis, became the first among the Eastern churches and exercised the ministry of headship, which involved convoking councils of the Eastern churches, although, as he specifies, always with the consent of the other patriarchs and never by the exercise of a universal jurisdiction. Bishop Hilarion of Vienna, the head of the Moscow delegation at Ravenna, recently contended, however, that there is no clearly established mechanism for calling such councils in the absence of the emperor, who in Byzantine times was in charge of orthodox unity. This problem has to be resolved among the orthodox, he says. Once again, 
I wonder whether it might not be best for us all to look at these matters together with all of the pieces of the jigsaw on the table, as it were. The Ravenna text notes that the holding of separate councils in the second millennium has further contributed to the estrangement of East and West, and it pledges that the means which will allow the re-establishment of ecumenical consensus must be sought out. Some years ago, the then Cardinal Ratzinger addressed a pointed question to the Catholic Orthodox dialogue on this very issue. It's a known fact, he said, that conciliarity has never functioned simply of its own accord by the pure and spontaneous harmony of plurality. Actually, he said, the authority of the emperor was necessary to summon a council. Well, the imperial church has now vanished, and the emperor too. And that means, he said, that if one wants to discuss the conciliarity of the church in a way that is realistic and meaningful, the question inevitably arises, what office is important enough from a theological point of view to replace and sustain the function fulfilled by the emperor? End of quote. While the drift of that question is fairly clear, <laughs> It's worth noting that on the very next page, Cardinal Ratzinger said that Catholic theology must be ready to be self-critical in this area because there have also been, and I quote, misguided developments where the primacy is concerned. End of quote. The fact is that there have been unfortunate turns on both sides, Catholic and Orthodox, and these must all, he said, be brought to light. What charity is needed for that to happen constructively? Many difficulties hinder this dialogue and it's alarming when new problems suddenly spring up. But we must surely trust that God who began this good work will bring it to completion. I'd like to give the final word to Yves Congar. 71 years ago, he wrote a momentous book, Chrétien des Unis, which paved the way for the Catholic Church to enter the ecumenical movement. He concluded that book with a remarkable reflection. And as we ourselves look towards Easter, his words are particularly apt. We must hope and we must pray, he said. Our sin and wickedness have entombed the unbroken unity of Christendom. And oppressed by the humanly insurmountable obstacles in the way of its restoration to us, we begin to ask, like the holy women at the sepulchre, who shall roll away for us the stone at the door of the tomb? Yet perhaps, said Congar, the angels of God have already been given a mission which we cannot foresee. Thank you.